Hello, welcome back to Tiny Artist TV. For today's video, I'm getting back into something that was sort of an integral part of my channel. Um, I'm going to be doing a Saturday morning shuffle today, and it's just going to be a fantasy character. Um, again, just kind of getting back into the groove of trying to post regular videos. And the best way to do that is to go back to my comfort zone because exploration is scary. However, instead of doing digital like I would normally do, I'm going to go back to my roots and do a little traditional sketch for you guys. Um, well, not a sketch, a full-blown drawing. So I'm going to randomly generate the character. I'm going to randomly generate their clothing, uh, clothing type with the Draw It app. Um, it's the app that I use for most of my character creation videos. It has several different tabs that help you just kind of get your brain juices flowing if you feel like you're kind of stuck in an art rut. And I will be using Coolers.co, my favorite color palette generator website, to generate the color palette for the character and then their clothing. So I will also be trying to match as closely as possible to the resources that I do have, but I do have several resources at my disposal. As you can see, I never gave an official new studio tour, but um, my wheel of tools and markers and all that good stuff. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So, oh, um, yeah, what I normally do is I normally pick a number one through, well, the last time I did this was a number one through 100, but we'll just do a number one through 10, and that will be our color palette, and let's see, yep, so I'll click the space bar six times to get my color palette, oh, it's so gray. <laughs> Uh, that's okay, we'll still make it work. Um, so that's going to be the color for my character, and I'm going to go ahead and save this so I can export this, or actually, well yeah, I'm going to save this so I can have this on screen to make sure that I'm picking the right colors later. And now I'll do another random number to determine the clothing color. So we're just going to do two more spaces. Oh, I actually really like that. It's pretty. It's nice and springy. I know we're still kind of in like the dead of winter, but I like this like kind of peach sherbet pastel color palette aesthetic. So I'm going to go ahead and pick my colors and then we'll get started with the drawing. So as you can see, and as previously mentioned, I have already, um, shuffled my characters so we have a dumb harpy with a weapon wearing this very um unassuming cute outfit balloon trousers with the flower pattern yeah so i'm picking the colors and i'm gonna have to try to stabilize my camera a little better to make it stop looking like it has a heartbeat apparently but here are my colors for the harpy and the clothing. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with drawing the character. And I have my paper set out to an 11 by, no, sorry. Yeah, 11 by 14. So it'll fit in a nice little standard frame if I decide to take this to the store and find a frame for it. But for now, we're just going to worry about getting this dumb harpy looking reasonable. So now that I have my thumbnail sketches established, it's time to start with the actual sketch. And as much as I actually really like the first one that I did, I decided to go with a completely different composition. I did a little research and I like to incorporate lore into these videos. What I did was I looked up flowers that are native to Greece and incorporated those into this kind of, um, it's not quite an orb, she's just sitting in this uh, oval type frame and I just really like the way oval frames just encapsulate things like a square frame is fine but oval frames just feel softer and more classical I suppose so I'm sketching her in the middle of an oval frame and I changed the pose um, I looked up a reference for the pose and just kind of drew that while looking at the screen um, and then of course just gave her all the classic harpy features 
including the balloon floral pants, which harpies aren't typically known to wear clothing, so the fact that she has minimal clothing on kind of makes sense. Basically just putting in a few extra elements to fill the space. So the other reason I decided to add flowers was not just because of lore, but again for space reasons. As you can see, after I finished the initial sketch of the harpy, there was a lot of extra space around her. So I fill in the surrounding space with uh, daffodils and gladiolus and hyacinth, all hand-drawn. A little tedious, but I actually do really enjoy drawing florals. And I give her this big cozy sword to swing. And then I also, just to further push the uh, lore side of this, I actually do uh, wrap a snake around the hilt of the sword to symbolize Medusa and her Gorgon sisters, who are known for having snakes as hair. So I thought that was kind of a cute Greek monster solidarity type thing. And now you can see I'm starting on sketching out the, f the rest of the flowers here, at least the petals for the hyacinth, all hand drawn. Sometimes there's just, there's no shortcuts, especially in traditional art. <laughs> This is just a closed version of the daffodil. The gladiolus that's going up top. And then an anemone peony that's going on the bottom. Or anemone poppy. Anemone poppy, yes, yeah, sorry. And then over here on the top uh, right, I am drawing the last flower, which is an iris, which those of you familiar with um, Greek history or Greek mythology may automatically think, oh, of course, iris makes sense. That's the name of one of the gods of the Pantheon. <laughs> I spared you the uh, extra five minutes of me lining out everything because realistically it did take me about an hour, hour and a half, maybe two hours. I was kind of going on and off taking breaks because there was a lot of small parts. But um, now I'm going in, I'm going from, because coloring for me, I always get very intimidated. Doing the line art, I'm very confident, but coloring, I always get a little like gun shy just because I'm not sure I'm ever like, I ever know really what I'm doing, but it always ends up turning out like pretty okay. So I'm just starting in the center, a comfortable space. I knew that I wanted to make her skin gray. So I start there. I knew I wanted to make her wings purple. Start there, easy enough. And then I go on to just basically working from the middle outwards from where I was most comfortable to where I was least sure of how I wanted to execute this design. So while the coloring is going on, I'm going to share some harpy stories with you guys. The harpies were mythological monsters in Greek mythology that had the form of a bird with a human female face. Often agents of punishment, they abducted people and tortured them on their way to Hades, employed by the god as an instrument for the punishment of the guilty. They stole food from their victims and would carry evildoers to Arianes of the Furies, a female goddess of vengeance and retribution. Their name means Snatcher, and is thus very appropriate for the acts they carried out. Known as the Hounds of Zeus, they were dispatched by the god to snatch away people and things from Earth. Sudden and mysterious disappearance were often attributed to them. Sounds kind of like the Greek version of being spirited away, which you'll find in a lot of Eastern Asian myths as well. They initially were classified as wind spirits, seen as a personification of destructive wind. Hesiod mentioned two harpies by name, Aiello, which means storm swift, and uspeat, meaning swift wing. Virgil called another, Seleno, darkness. In the Homeric poems, the harpies are nothing but personified storm wind, and he only named Podarch, which means felt foot, kind of cute, who was married to the west wind Zephyrus and gave birth to the two horses of Achilles, Xanthus and Balius. 
Hesiod described them as lovely, fair-locked, winged maidens, the daughters of Talmus and the Oceanid Electra, who surpassed winds and birds in speed of flight. Grecian pottery depicts the harpies as beautiful women with wings. However, as early as Aeschylus and the Eumenides, harpies were described as ugly creatures with wings, and later writers would carry these characteristics so far as to represent them as disgusting, cruel, and terrifying monsters that were always ravenously hungry. Sometimes they were thought to be cousins of the Gorgons, the three sisters with hair made of horrible venomous snakes, and the stone-wielding stare, with Medusa being the famous of the three. So, it does make sense that she's holding a sword with Medusa-type paraphernalia on it. It just works out. Everything in Greek mythology is connected somehow. They appear as evil forces in Ovid's story of King Phineas of Thrace, whom Zeus gave the gift of prophecy. Phineas used his gift against the gods, uncovering their secret plans, and was thus punished by an angry Zeus. Sentenced to an island, blind, and with the buffet of food he could not eat because the harpies would steal the food before he was able to indulge and satisfy his hunger. Years later, Phineas was rescued by his fate by Jason of the Argonauts, and the winged Boreatus drove the harpies away. The Boreatus were twin winged brothers named Callias and Zeitz, son of Boreas and Orthea. The goddess Iris commanded that they turn back and not harm the wind spirits, thus the dogs of great Zeus, the harpies, escaped to the cave of Minoan Crete, leaving their past residents of the island called Strophides. In exchange, the exiled king told Jason how to pass this Simplegades rock. In this form, the harpies acted as agents of punishment, vicious, cruel, and violent. According to the story of the daughters of Perdanius, the gods killed King Perdanius and his wife, and the king stole a bronze dog from Zeus. His daughter Cleodora and Merope were spared and raised by several of the Greek goddesses on Mount Olympus, particularly Aphrodite. When the girls reached of age to be married off, Aphrodite went to seek permission from Zeus for the marriages, and while she was gone, the harpies came and took the daughters to be servants of the Furies. The Harpies, like many characters in Greek mythology, evolved over time through different tales, beginning as wind spirits, then personified as winged women, and eventually into the monstrous creatures we most recognize today. Other interesting facts, according to godsandgoddesses.net, Harpies remained vivid mythological beasts through the Middle Ages, and in Dante's Inferno, Harpies infest a tortured wood in the Seven Rings of Hell, where the suicides have their punishment. Roman and Byzantine writers detailed their ugliness and monstrous qualities, and in the Aeneid, Aeneas encountered the Harpies on the Strophides as they made off with the feast the Trojans were setting. Seleno cursed them, and the Trojans fled in fear of the mythical beast. In Much Ado About Nothing by Shakespeare, the term harpy is used metaphorically to refer to nasty or annoying women, and though not often used in modern vernacular, it is understood that this is what the term currently describes. So in addition to harpy mythology, I also have some Greek flower, um, what would you call it? I guess Victorians call it the language of flowers, just some uh, flower meanings tied to the flowers that are represented here. Again, um, the daffodil, the iris, gladiolus, etc, etc. So starting with the hyacinth, since that's the first on the list that I have for you guys. According to Greek mythology, hyacinths are associated with the tears of the sun god. He and Zephyrus, the west wind, loved and admired the handsome Spartan prince Hyacinth. However, Hyacinth's attention was on Apollo, and thus, when they were throwing discus, Zephyrus blew the discus and it struck Hyacinth, killing him instantly. When Apollo saw that his lover was dead, he wept, and where his tears landed, the beautiful Hyacinth flowers sprouted. Daffodils The daffodil is associated with the term narcissist. Uh, daffodils are known as the narcissist flower and are associated with Narcissus, or Narcissus, however you want to pronounce it, um, who many girls in his village admired, but he was too self-centered to notice. After breaking Echo's heart, Nemesis, the god of revenge, punished him, 
she lured him to a pond where he drowned after falling in love with his reflection, and where he sat admiring himself, the narcissist flowers sprouted, representing selfishness and cold-heartedness. Gladiolus. The name Gladiolus can be traced back to the Greek term for sword. They named it so due to its tall spikes and narrow leaves that closely resemble a sword. The anemone. Like most Greek flowers, anemones are associated with the death of Adonis, the lover of Venus, goddess of love. According to Greek mythology, when Venus heard her lover's cries, she rushed to his side only to witness him bleeding to death due to an attack by a wild boar. As his droplets of blood touched the ground, red anemones grew. According to another version, the anemones were white and turned red upon Adonis dropping blood on them. And the final flower that we have in our lineup is the iris. Iris is the Greek god of colors and the rainbow. According to ancient Greek mythology, Iris used the rainbow as a bridge between heaven and earth, while others thought it was part of her robe or multicolored veil. So these are just a few um, flowers that are associated with Greco-Roman mythology. I keep saying Greco-Roman. It's specifically Greek culture this time. It's not just thrown together in a blanket statement. But I did forget, I did add one more little detail. The flowers that are on this harpy's pants are actually the aster flower. And aster flowers, um, there are two various Greek myths concerning this particular flower. The most common being about Asteria, the goddess of justice. Sorry, not Asteria. That's the goddess of celestials. Astraea, the goddess of justice, innocence, and purity. According to this mythology, when Zeus decided to destroy the world with a flood because of the wars among men, Astraea was saddened and she wished to become a star. Her wish was granted, but she saw the loss of the lives from the sky. She was saddened and cried, and beautiful aster flowers sprouted at every spot her tears landed on earth. So basically, flowers are just the product of gods dying and crying. Beautiful. <laughs> But um, that is it for today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed learning these little harpy facts and Greek flower facts. And um, I hope you guys enjoyed watching me draw a design in traditional instead of digital this time. I know it's kind of rare. Um, usually when I do traditional art, I don't record it because I like the stress of not having to have this perception of perfection. So. I took a little more time on this one because I was so nervous about messing up, but maybe in the future I'll do more traditional videos and won't be so nervous about that. And um, it'll also be a good way to just show you guys work process with traditional style tools. I know a lot of people do digital art now because it's more accessible and it's a lot easier to clean things up if you mess up, but it's also really good to figure out how to work with just having paper and pens and markers sometimes too. So I've rambled on enough. Um, I hope you guys again enjoyed this video. I'll see you in the next one. Have a weird day.